Dear friends, we sincerely thank everyone for joining our sponsored data workshop on GAN-based contact tracing and challenges. First, let me share my screen. I'm Vivek Sharma, a research scientist at MIT, Harvard, and TIT. So this is the agenda of our workshop today. Now we are going to start off our event with the opening session from David Kong and Ramesh Raskar. Okay, thank you so much, Vivek. And um, it's great to be here again with you all. Uh, my name is David Sun Kong. I direct the Community Biotechnology Initiative at the Media Lab at MIT. Um, it's been a real pleasure and honor working with uh, Vivek and Ramesh and all of the wonderful folks across MIT that are really trying to figure out these very, very difficult technology management um, problems that are connected to implementing these uh, very promising digital technologies that hopefully can really do a, a make us make a strong role in helping to suppress the pandemic. And so, as we know, there are very really significant challenges that are involved in trying to ultimately both develop and implement um, these technology solutions. And um, I think something we've seen over the past number of weeks is uh, the diversity of different stakeholders that are involved. And um, in a way, uh, the, the different challenges that we face in trying to bring all of these stakeholders together. And that is a function I think that we believe here at MIT, we can play a really critical role in, um, in helping to facilitate helping to convene these thought leaders and really learn uh, from each other how to ultimately develop and manage these technology solutions. So um, we've been over the past uh, session or so starting to frame this uh, particular challenge around digital contact tracing and exposure notification as the quote unquote impossible app, given the uh, real kind of array of challenges that we face uh, from working with different stakeholders like public health officials, government officials, all the key technology uh, folks as well. And so today we're really excited to have another wonderful session. Um, there's going to be a number again of uh, fantastic speakers and experts that are gonna address uh, some of the latest issues in GAIN and in uh, digital technologies related to contact tracing. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ramesh who has been again, uh, bringing together all of these wonderful forces from around the world and in the United States and beyond. So uh, Ramesh, uh, over to you. Thank you, David. Uh, what a pleasure. Thanks for that introduction. So yes, let's talk about the impossible app for exposure notification and case management. And let's take a comparison with other crises like a hurricane versus the current pandemics. If you think about the apps for the two, the National Weather Service, the National Hurricane Center uses two things, live data from a bird, from a satellite, with this bird's eye view, and then models of prior hurricanes. And those two things are critical to predict and intervene and help the population. And you can think of this as a very effective top-down solution. Epidemics, on the other hand, are innocent people infecting other innocent people. <clears throat> and so we want individuals uh, as sensors. You know, we want people as sensors. And for we, this, we need a bottom-up solution to understand the social contacts. And of course, for that, smartphones can be great if it can be privacy preserving. The good news is that 90% of the US population in the age 18 to 64 has a smartphone. So there's something we can do about it. So the Trusted Pandemic Tech Program, um, you know, we're thinking of them as two stages. The first stage is to use smartphones, use Google, Apple exposure notification and other case management apps for states. And we think there are four main challenges, the complexity of the technology, the app and the server, uh, how do you preserve privacy? It's not just about the Bluetooth privacy, but many other aspects, and also the perception of privacy, adoption and trust, what should be the mechanisms and algorithms and techniques and social, uh, social mechanisms. And also how does all of this actually help the public health, the verification server, closing the loop with tests and so on. And so in stage one, what we're doing here is doing three things, uh, sharing the learnings by bringing all the stakeholders together in terms of technology, bringing folks who are working on algorithms and standards and data set uh, on a common platform, and also conducting a lot of boot camps of how do you build the apps, how do you build a server, what does it mean to do adoption and so on. And stage two is about modeling and data integration uh, so that we are prepared and ready for response. Uh, but for now, it's all about stage one, about the technology complexity, the privacy, and so on. Uh, and what you have seen over time uh, is, uh, as part of this trusted pandemic tech, 
you can think of it as kind of below the operating system and above the operating system. Below the operating systems are all the issues of you know, the Bluetooth protocol, uh, making a decision on what is too close for too long and so on. And our partners here uh, at MIT and NIST uh, have spoken and they'll continue to be engaged. If you think about above the OS, uh, then we also have uh, in a lot of complexity. Uh, the experts that have spoken so far are from World Wide Web Consortium, uh, who, who of course have maybe you know, the most credibility in thinking about creating new digital ecosystems, uh, PathCheck Foundation, explaining about the Gain app and servers, uh, APHL, uh, and my national server, NSF talking about what they are doing to stimulate research uh, in this space, uh, MIT Technology Review, you can call them you know, the new police for uh, keeping track of these apps uh, because MIT Technology Review has a very detailed analysis of what the apps are doing. Are they uh, open source? Are they adhering to protocols uh, and so on? MIT Isolate Program, which is the data science program uh, for COVID-19. And then a lot of other stakeholders in public health, uh, Mayo Clinic experts um, uh, are, are part of this effort. Uh, MIT GovLab, uh, NSF again, uh, and also about 80 Fortune 400 companies uh, at MIT Media Lab. So we are very, we are very uh, honored to have uh, all these folks as part of the expert panel for uh, Trusted Pandemic Tech. So let's focus a little bit more on the app itself, which is a stage one. Uh, so as you know, exposure notification and case management is about using the smartphone for Bluetooth-based proximity. Uh, stage two is notify if you have crossed path and give them an exposure notification. Uh, and then third is to create tools so that public health and businesses can make some sense of it. Honestly, at this stage, uh, the Google Apple-based exposure notification, it's not clear if it's that useful for public health and businesses. So that still has to evolve as time goes on. Uh, so this Google Apple exposure notification protocol, GAIN, which is what we'll be talking about today, is fantastic because it's privacy by design, gives you proximity based on Bluetooth, Unfortunately, you cannot use any other sensors or cannot extract other data that's already on your phone. So it, it presents its own challenges. So why are we calling this the impossible app? Because it's an app that should have 60, 70% of the adoption in a state in a matter of days. And the benefits are vague for the person who's carrying it. The benefits of people who are exposed, but the person who uh, is going to submit the exposure keys, the benefits to them are, are questionable. Um, the, there are a lot of doubts about privacy. We do believe in privacy as geeks, but how to explain to individuals is challenging. By the way, such an app has to be deployed by not some you know, crazy smart app developers and, and a startup, but should be deployed by public health who have many other constraints. So how are we going to launch an app that has 60, 70% penetration with questionable benefits and infringes on beliefs of personal freedom, get it out there. That's the impossible app. Public health is busy enough, you know, dealing with all the other issues and they can't have yet another, uh, you know, challenging task uh, at their hand. So that's why the trusted pandemic tech program for this impossible app and helping US states and nations, you know, how can we overcome privacy perceptions by using conversations with ethicists, stakeholders, and also computational algorithms. What should be the adoption strategies, messaging, incentives, engaging stakeholders? How can we reduce the cost as emphatically down to zero? Because right now it can cost between a million to $10 million per state. Uh, but if we have open source and shared learnings, clearly the asymptotic cost should be zero. Uh, and how does it connect to public health? Because any new digital innovation takes a very long time before it can be integrated into public health. And we're expecting something to happen in a matter of weeks. Um, and closing the loop with tracing, whether manual contact tracing or PCR antigen testing is a big unknown here as well. So let's think about what are some good parameters for a smartphone solution. Uh, within the three main things, one is it should be built by a nonprofit. Um, and the reason for that is in today's highly connected world, uh, in the world of um, kind of surveillance capitalism, uh, there's often misuse of data. Uh, and often it's not intentional, uh, but the metadata 
from any app, any smartphone application is always leaking. It can be as simple as your IP address. It can be a brand of your phone. It could be which data plan you have. A whole bunch of data is getting leaked uh, from the app to the server and every, everybody in between. So this can create a lot of challenge. And you would say, hey, that's happening with any app you use anyway. The difference here is that very few apps have such a deep penetration from one single company. So if you take a state and you have 60% penetration, it creates an unprecedented view into that population. If you add any ad tech data from the same phone, so a food delivery app or a dating app or a weather app or, or financial transaction app, those apps are actually using some probes, some telemetry that goes back to some companies. And that data is aggregated and sold uh, to whoever needs it. So if you take the combination of the two, even if the Google Exposure Protocol is private, the overlapping of these two data can create an unprecedented view. So a for-profit entity can run into a lot of trouble because there's a lot of temptation to use this data in unique ways. And you can try to do this by regulation, but that will be too complicated. So the best way to deal with this is to have a charter for a nonprofit that they will not use the data for anything else. Um, or have an organization that says that data will not be used for anything else at all, completely uh, sandboxed, uh, and treat this operation as a, uh, a utility for social good, just like any other utility can be audited uh, at any point. And we think that can be achieved only for a nonprofit. If you just take, take the example of an IP address, uh, of, of an app, uh, the IP address actually tells quite a bit about what this app is doing. So for example, uh, you know, imagine you have a sensitive individual, they work in a particular company, uh, let's say they work at a particular uh, uh, site, uh, that IP address is known. And if they move from that site to somewhere else, uh, that IP address is con constantly, be the new IP address is constantly being linked. So it's possible to say for a given app, which IP addresses did it? That allows you to create a time series of those IP addresses. And that can be used by a for-profit company in many ways. It's already getting used. So I'm not saying anything new. The only difference is it's very rare for companies to have 60, 70% penetration. Even Facebook has only 60% penetration. And companies like Facebook, there are a lot of eyes you know, looking over Facebook. And fortunately, these companies are you know, very open about what they do uh, with this data. But if you have small companies proliferating and applying the solutions, that's gonna be a lot of challenge. So it should be built by a nonprofit. Second, uh, uh, it should be open sourced uh, so that the trust uh, in the system can go up. Uh, but it's also very important that there is no lock on the vendor. A common challenge in choosing a for-profit company, open source, uh, if they're not open source, uh, is that they would create a solution uh, that's easy to go, but any maintenance, any new features, it'll be nearly impossible for that state to roll back the clock and say, oh, actually we don't like what you're doing or you're overcharging us for what's going on uh, and we're going to roll back to some other solution. So the lock can be extremely problematic. Same thing with replication. If one state wants to collaborate with another state, they should be able to replicate everything they have if it's open source and move on. It's very, very also, also very important to share those learnings, not just in discussion forums, but also share the learnings in terms of the code itself, code segment itself. If there's any clever mechanism one state has come up with, it should be possible for other states, especially neighboring states, to immediately deploy them uh, in the very next version. And also it should be interoperable across state boundaries. And by that, I, mean, I don't just mean interoperability of the Bluetooth keys, but also other interoperability. What if one state decides to use you know, a particular type, type of a symptom check uh, and they would, like to, uh, uh, they would like to make sure that neighboring states are also have, have access to this privacy preserving data of symptoms. I mean, right now, electronic health records is already a big mess uh, across state boundaries. We are talking about moving into a very innovative space here uh, of, of, um, of personal data, although privacy preserving. So unless the interoperability is in the ethos of the states, it will be very challenging. So again, if it's for-profit, closed source, it'll take too long for those two companies providing apps to those two states to talk to each other and, and start solving these problems. So nonprofit, open source, treat it like 
in a, an auditable entity. Now let's think about beyond exposure notification. We're going to see a lot of innovation in this space in the next few weeks, in the next few months. Especially as I said in the beginning, the connection to public health and manual contact tracing is an unsolved problem. As much as we love all the great work that Google and Apple are doing, this is a problem that will have to be solved by innovation ecosystems out there. Which also means the apps and the servers are all going to change very rapidly. Ideally, the manual contract tracing, uh, which is an important piece of the puzzle, is very expensive. Some states cannot even afford it. Many international uh, global locations cannot afford it. So we should be able to dramatically reduce the cost of manual contract tracing while improving the efficiency of the systems. And one of the reasons we need manual contact tracing is um, being able to reach people who are actually uh, underserved. Often language issues, people who are distrustful of the government and so on. So it's very critical to start thinking about solutions that are beyond exposure notification. And it goes back to the vendor lock issue. If you have a vendor lock, then you're dependent on the innovation rate of that particular vendor, as opposed to an open innovation, open standards uh, ecosystem. Um, and the calculations right now, uh, we have a paper coming up, shows that the cost of a digital app, including OPEX and, and, and CAPEX, is about 10 cents per person per year, including the app and the server. Uh, as opposed to that, so that would be about uh, that would be about seven hundred thousand uh, dollars for a state like Massachusetts, and again, this is starting from scratch. As emptotically as more states adopting it, and if this is a membership-based model, then this cost, as emptotically, will actually go to zero. So the parameters for good smartphone solution uh, in our trusted pandemic tech program uh, we are proud of is: let's keep it nonprofit, let's keep it open source, and let's keep it ready for this very rapid innovation. Uh, and so we're very delighted to work with a whole range of partners uh, who are uh, part of this conversation. Uh, and for the last point, going beyond exposure notification, this triage, this testing, this quarantine, this exit, this entry pass, there's a lot of innovation coming uh, in the next few weeks, in the next few months. Uh, and this is kind of in the experience of an individual through this COVID experience. Fortunately, they just get exposure notification uh, and everything else is smooth. Uh, but often they might have to go for a test. They might turn positive. They might have to quarantine. And creating an ecosystem that's open standards, open innovation is very challenging. So the goal for us is to make sure this is all achieved in a privacy preserving way. And same thing for businesses uh, as well. Um, as we think about lockdowns, so we think about reopenings, there's a very complex decision the business had to take and the exposure notification app should serve uh, their purpose as well. They cannot be keep, kept uh, outside this circle of stakeholders. So that's why as part of uh, the Trusted Pandemic Tech, we also have 80 member companies, Fortune 500 member companies uh, at MIT, at MIT Media Lab, and also MIT LP program. And we're engaging with many of them to make sure uh, they also are at the discussion uh, for the, they're on the table uh, for this discussion. Okay. Let's talk about uh, some upcoming directions and also some challenges as we're going to run into as we think about exposure notification. Uh, so, you know, uh, from uh, my research group at MIT, we have been publishing a series of papers uh, that would talk about uh, Bluetooth, but also other signals uh, that we might start including, including GPS, Wi-Fi, QR codes, uh, and so on. And how does it actually start mapping into analytics and machine learning? So over the next few minutes, let me give you a flavor of upcoming innovations uh, in this space. So first of all, right now we have a problem. Uh, public health is demanding that they would like to get more context for that exposure notification. The first version of these apps will of course have no context at all. The only thing you will know is exposure uh, and the day of the exposure, that's it. Um, and it's up to the individual to talk, to the, talk on the phone with manual contact tracer to provide answers to all these questions. Where were you? What were you doing? Were you wearing a mask? Or did you shake hands? And so on. And this is going to create a lot of confusion or could reduce trust in the system. So what public health officials have been telling us is they need a much, they need much detailed tools to interview the person who was exposed, find heat maps of where the exposures are, and then do spread analysis, right? And this way, you know, we won't get uh, we won't see kind of a societal challenge, even a civil unrest in some countries, 
uh, where minorities are blamed for un when somebody gets an exposure notification, uh, an individual gets an exposure notification, they may not understand why they got the exposure notification, and they might start blaming people they like to blame, often minorities, immigrants, people at you know who are who are at the bottom of a socioeconomic uh, pyramid, uh, and then that could lead to you know overzealous enforcement, you know strange lockdowns uh, and things like that. So clearly, public health requires more than contact tracing. Uh, which goes well beyond the exposure notification. So what can we do about this? Uh, of course, in the first version of the GAIN apps, we cannot do this, uh, but actually there are other solutions coming up. You can add to the Bluetooth broadcast, you can add some extra contact. So that GPS is not used for logging, but it's used only for context. So it's not used for proximity or any kind of long-term logging, uh, but it's encrypted with the diagnosis key and and shared or broadcast over the Bluetooth channel so that the exposed person can only decrypt it, can only decrypt the location and other context only, only, only if they get an exposure notification. So there's some great papers from my groups, and other researchers coming up uh, in this space. Uh, what about Wi-Fi? That seems very promising, uh, especially in door locations. And if Bluetooth has been turned off, uh, given that the Wi-Fi infrastructure is everywhere, um, uh, workplaces and so on. And there are two ways to think about Wi-Fi. Uh, the first one is kind of phone driven. So it's just an app that records the MAC addresses of all the, all the access points uh, and use that as effectively a co-location uh, signal. Uh, but in reality, uh, the MAC addresses are, are, uh, are you know, as bad as GPS in terms of being able to recover the exact location. So we're gonna go back to what I showed in the previous slide, which is either use an external server or use the Wi-Fi MAC address as a context that's transmitted over the Bluetooth channel. So only the exposed person gets to know what happened. The other way to do this is to not worry about smartphones at all, but use the access points and look at the log of the MAC addresses of smartphones and, and run a system along those lines. Um, and, the, and for more privacy, you can add rotating MAC addresses uh, and, and so on. The challenge here is the agency of the individual is lost. So everybody's being tracked, uh, without them knowing about it, because they don't even have to use a smartphone, they don't even have to, uh, you know, download an app, and the smartphones are already being tracked. So, conclusion here is that there is no easy, fully privacy-preserving Wi-Fi solution. In workplaces, it may be okay because you have different notions of privacy, but there's a lot of research uh, coming uh, in this space. Um, and then also there are other methods using secure multi-party computation that can also add a lot of privacy, uh, a lot of encryption. Uh, in this space. Uh, so my group and other groups have published kind of a two server solution. Uh, and I think it will be fantastic with a first server that provides homomorphic encryption and second server that generate keys very much like the existing uh, Bluetooth protocol. So the conclusion here is that actually a GPS Wi-Fi based solution can create the best privacy for the healthy phones, uh, but there'll be some leakage for the infected people, which could be you know 0.1% of the population uh, at any given moment. So for those 14 days, you know, some of their privacy could be challenged, but for healthy phones, actually best privacy. I would even argue that uh, because GPS and Wi-Fi can be accessed completely privately, for healthy people, uh, it's even better privacy than Bluetooth. Uh, because in Bluetooth, you have to constantly transmit every 200 millisecond a random code. But the fact that you're transmitting something from your phone at all can be used uh, in some scenarios if you have physical access to that environment. Uh, so I think there's some really great innovations coming. Uh, we'll also see when Google, Apple, and other stakeholders in the space will change the protocols. That could take weeks or months or even a year, uh, but it's very important for us to be ready uh, for this innovation. And then finally, let me talk about uh, machine learning. So we have this trade-off in this whole COVID-19 um, kind of crowd sensing, crowd participation, which is the trade-off between utility and privacy. Uh, on one hand, uh, solutions like Google Maps, we give away all our privacy and we give our location to Google in real time. In return for that, we get fantastic benefits, like we can see where the traffic is and we can avoid traffic. When it comes to health data, we are kind of on the bottom right where everything is private, everything is siloed and cannot be used for societal good. We cannot do analysis, global analysis, on this, uh, on this uh, silo data. So the goal here is if we start including more operations 
in this gain apps, you know, whether they're questionnaires or at some point we start using sensors for diagnostics or there's existing data that's already on the phone, maybe in your health app, for example. If you want to start using that, how can we use that data to create global mechanisms to create alerts, do analysis uh, for COVID-19 without exchanging raw data on the phone in a privacy preserving way? If you anonymize it, there's not much privacy, uh, and we can talk about that later. You can obfuscate it with techniques like differential privacy, uh, but then you can do inference, but not full-fledged machine learning. And probably the best kind of privacy is by using encryption, like I said, homomorphic encryption, but then you cannot even do inference, only you can do statistics and some analytics. So two techniques have emerged uh, in the last uh, few years. One is called federated learning from Google, and another one is called split learning from our group uh, at MIT. And they allow you to smash the data in such a way that you can run full-fledged uh, machine learning models. Uh, so we think innovations like this are going to be very critical uh, as we try to go for COVID-19 solutions uh, beyond exposure notification. So to conclude, uh, we are here as the Trusted Pandemic Tech series in stage one, focusing on helping states and nation launch their gain and case management apps, take complexity, privacy, adoption, and connection to public health. And you, I hope you'll join us uh, every Thursday for shared learnings, algorithms, standards, data sets, uh, and boot camps. Uh, and we are very delighted to have many partners uh, as part of uh, this Trusted Pandemic Tech program, uh, and we'll continue to uh, engage more partners uh, as time goes on. Thank you. And let me hand it over to uh, Sam Zimmerman, who's going to talk about um, how to build gain apps. Thanks, Ramesh. Um, can everyone see my screen? Um, and I uh, also want to invite uh, Lena, uh, a member of our, our team as well. She'll be, she'll be joining me in, in the conversation. Um, yeah, so I'm Sam Zimmerman. I'm the CTO of PathCheck. Uh, PathCheck is a community of uh, a community of uh, tech entrepreneurs um, who have come together, uh, technologists and tech entrepreneurs who have come together uh, to build uh, uh, and expand the use of digital contact tracing technologies uh, around the world. Um, my talk today is going to be first describe a bit more about uh, about the PathCheck Foundation, uh, who we are, what we're about. Uh, We'll then explore uh, a bit about um, the, the complications involved uh, with building one protocol between two of the biggest tech companies in the world who have so far built their operating system broadly in isolation from one another. Uh, we'll then kind of discuss um, some of the gotchas and pitfalls uh, that we've seen around um, our building of the application as well as uh, some, uh, some uh, learnings from jurisdictions uh, around the world. Um, We'll also discuss the, the verification server, the, the part of this protocol that, that verifies that an individual is in fact COVID-19 positive. Uh, to quote uh, the Swiss team, it's the, the secretly the most difficult part uh, of launching an application um, and, and we'll kind of highlight some of those complications and learnings. We'll then discuss uh, the EPI program uh, and um, our, our kind of current thinking uh, on the matter, uh, some of our uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting and challenging uh, uh, problem, and there's a lot of kind of edge cases uh, when you, you sit and look at these, these algorithms. Uh, and lastly, we'll, we'll reflect on uh, the 1.5, uh, the API version uh, that Google is pushing out and that Apple will have a, a similar numbered version coming soon, uh, and how it changes things uh, for the better. Um, so to, to go to kind of that path, path check who we are and what we're about, um, we are a team of, of about 50 full-time individuals across all the domains you would see in a, in a normal technology company. We have a, a large number of, of world-class engineers. Um, we have uh, product design, user experience, marketing, security, compliance, um, all formed uh, over the past couple of months uh, by individuals who uh, are interested and passionate about building technology um, to help combat COVID. Uh, 
Our, our, our repositories have over 100 uh, unique contributors at this time. Uh, I started to count the countries, uh, but determined that that would be a little, uh, little take a little too much time. Uh, but it is uh, truly uh, been a worldwide effort uh, uh, and um, something that yeah really is um, um, uh, created uh, and consistently recreated um, day over day. Um, this number is actually a bit dated. Uh, we have 1,800 uh, volunteers in our Slack group, so 1,800 volunteers who are uh, engaged in some way, uh, contributing in, in, in some capacity or, or listening to the Slack channels and, and, and contributing to the discussion. Um, we are, are very fortunate, and, and I think one of our, our major, um, one of the things I think we're doing relatively uniquely is we're launching uh, jurisdictions around the world at the same time. Uh, uh, I believe this number also <laughs> is a bit dated, um, but we're, we're launching in, in, in Europe, uh, we're launching in uh, Central America, we have states and territories engaged as well. Um, so we're, we're, we get to see a lot of the, the challenges associated with various jurisdictions and then share them in a pretty uh, expeditious manner by either embedding them in our product uh, or sharing them with our implementation teams. Uh, and it's really resulting in a lot faster deployments. Uh, so for instance, uh, doing, we're doing testing, uh, beta testing of our, our build. Uh, and by doing that beta testing once, uh, many jurisdictions can, can trust that that build kind of meets their needs. Uh, and similar are things around making sure the credentials are set up, uh, developing marketing and branding assets. Uh, we're really hoping to, uh, and, and finding that by, by working with so many jurisdictions, uh, we're able to share learnings and frankly expedite timelines, which is, which is, uh, really, really encouraging and important for, for this problem. Our, our jurisdictions represent over 50 million citizens. Um, and as uh, Ramesh was talking about earlier, the opportunity to be in front of, to, to, to have adoption at, you know, at 60, 70%, even, even 20% for 50 million citizens uh, is the sort of thing that uh, Googles and Apples uh, think about um, and the opportunity for uh, a group of technologists uh, to execute on that and uh, have the app scale so quickly is, is a tremendous challenge and honor and one of the more exciting parts about the project for me. Um, we've also been uh, kind of co-creating this, this work. Um, we're, we're in constant conversation with Apple, constant conversation with Google, constant conversation uh, with other teams and jurisdictions. Uh, and we're kind of helping to identify issues uh, and, and triage them as we go. Um, so I think it's a, it's been a, a real honor, and I think one that we've seen most in the in the server itself, uh, the Google's open source server rep rep um, um, uh, reference implementation, um, we're we're able to kind of uh, be thought partners uh, and and catch this technology that's that's still frankly hardening, uh, that, that that's not um, built in in the classic way, taking multiple years, but instead over the course of weeks, and as a result. Uh, there needs to be kind of community involvement and engagement in, in addressing those issues. Um, great. Uh, so now I'm just going to switch my screen really quickly and give you a brief uh, download of uh, our uh, of our demo. Um, I'll highlight that this is actually kind of our our bare bones um, offering. We actually have a pretty different offering for different jurisdictions um, and aren't going to be sharing kind of that that. Uh, jurisdiction specific build quite yet uh, hasn't been been signed off on um, but really we're hopefully just going to walk through the, the major pieces of functionality uh, and show you a bit about how that works um, so I'm just going to switch screens really quickly um, great so if you see my phone um, you'll see that I have uh, multiple um, uh, path check applications uh, we actually customize uh, the icons uh, and the the branding for each state. Um, but in in test flight, where we're doing the beta testing, uh, we're actually focused kind of on, on just a, a path check basic build. Um, so you'll see here that I, I have um, two different um, apps that I can toggle between. Uh, here I can make sure that I uh, enable exposure notifications for uh, a given jurisdiction. Um, You'll see that there's a set of exposure reports um, that allow me to 
uh, drill down uh, and see if there has in fact been uh, a COVID-19 exposure with basic information and customization uh, allowed. Uh, in this case, uh, we're, we're uh, imagining that the, the state of Minnesota uh, kicking it off to uh, their page to enable uh, integration of, of our application uh, into the, the manual contact tracing and public health workflows that Minnesota likes. Um, uh, lastly, we have the ability to uh, uh, implement the, the major flows. Uh, so the COVID-19 uh, positive flow, um, the individual who is trying to, uh, has a COVID-19 positive test and wants to submit their keys for that test. So we can walk through that quickly now. Uh, you'll see that there's uh, a verification diagnosis code. Um, I'm going to switch screens really quickly uh, and show you our implementation of the verification server, which we'll be we'll be talking about uh, in a bit. Um, uh, let me just pull that up over here. Just give me one second. Uh, great. So if you see my screen here, this is our reference implementation of the verification server. So this is the service that uh, validates that an individual is in fact uh, COVID-19 positive through integration with either a manual contact tracing flow or an automated uh, uh, messaging like service. Um, so you'll see that we support, uh, this allows for three, we predominantly focus on the confirmed positive test result. Um, we also allow for kind of a symptom onset date um, and can base our risk scoring off of that. So uh, here I'll, I'll note that the, the, the symptom onset was the 10th of August and I have the ability to generate a code. Uh, that code, uh, which is generated either in a programmatic manner via API calls or the, in a manual manner, a manual contact tracer using this flow or a similar one to generate a code. Uh, and we'll talk about the trade-offs of doing that in, in a bit. Um, we can take this code um, and enter that into the device here. Um, so we go to verify your diagnosis. We hit 31607. 387 and hit submit. So this then uh, asks the user explicitly, uh, this is coming from the, 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 the implementation, the APIs itself require this kind of OS level permission. You hit share, the individual understands and consents, uh, at which place those keys are then uploaded uh, to our implementation of the Google Apple exposure notification uh, key server. This is responsible for taking those COVID-19 positive keys uh, and uh, pushing them out uh, to allow uh, other phones, phones all around the jurisdiction, uh, to tur put, turn down those keys, pull down those keys, see if they've had a match. Uh, and if in the event they have had a match, uh, 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 allow them to walk through a post-exposure notification flow. Um, and so this, this exposure history uh, is is our primary flow for uh, um, for whenever an individual has had an exposure. I actually uh, just uninstalled and reinstalled and wiped my device, so I actually don't have any exposures now. Um, but we are generating exposures and actually are, are in in te live tests with uh, kind of multiple states uh, and, and territories in the U.S. in particular. So. That's the, 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 the application at a high level that, that we're building, uh, and again, really intensely and thoughtfully skinning um, for uh, jurisdictions around the world to make sure that they can um, drive adoption uh, and, and keep the apps installed on their phone. Um, so now I'm going to switch back to um, my, switch back to the, the demo. Um, so next, we're going to talk a little bit about the fact that there's kind of one API implementation uh, and some just subtle differences. And here, I'll very much lean on uh, on on Lena. Uh, so please do uh, jump in whenever whenever 
like Lena is um, uh, very, very much uh, the domain expert uh, in in understanding many of and and helped unearth uh, many of the things we'll be talking about um, in this conversation. So the the first point to highlight at a high level is that you would think, and frankly, we thought uh, when we started this that really the APIs would be pretty much exactly the same. Uh, that there would be um, working in the uh, uh, Apple context and the Google context, there would be you know, exact similar names uh, or exact similar out of the box uh, uh, functions uh, or objects to be called. Um, and in fact, that's, that's not the case. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a, a, a list that was assembled um, uh, when trying to uh, wrap, uh, wrap our heads around the, the, the difficulties um, uh, or the, the differences between them. Um, I think that the, you'll see that uh, as the, the, the slide highlights, there, there's differences uh, particularly around, on several of the major objects, the exposure summary, exposure information, exposure config, and risk score. Some of them are, are small, uh, like naming uh, changes. Some are actually rather subtle uh, like, uh, ways of, of making it easier to implement more subtle risk scoring metrics. Um, and I think that th this, this risk score in particular one uh, has the ability, uh, if not paying close attention to, to, to implement kind of different risk scoring algorithms uh, between the two uh, uh, um, uh, implementations or APIs. Um, so this is kind of, again, it's the high level distinction between um, th that these are two different APIs, uh, not, uh, not, not quite the same. Um, uh, another really, really important thing, and I think this is going to get even more important in time, uh, is that they're, they are, they're deployed on two totally different operating systems. Um, the uh, Apple operating system uh, requires a software update um, uh, that it, in order to enable the uh, enable exposure notifications. And while Apple's has a, a tremendous amount of success in pushing uh, operating system updates, uh, uh, in classic pre-pandemic era, getting you know eighty to ninety percent updates uh, in six months is really, really really astounding when you think of the, the Windows update problems of the, of the early 2000s. Uh, with that said, uh, in a pandemic, uh, that's actually like a, a pretty long time period. And so while pushing an operating system update uh, and kind of expecting that update to only really surface in six months, uh, you really need to be thoughtful about understanding what percent of the population is working uh, for, for on, on iOS which percent uh, has um, which versions of the operating system. And you can't automatically assume uh, that a uh, update, uh, a software update kind of, uh, your, your, your population is gonna be working from it, uh, particularly whenever we're talking days and weeks and at most months. Android, uh, at least so far, we've really seen that Android that, uh, was able to, to update and allow this exposure notification configuration via the Play Store, so not requiring an operating system update. Uh, and that's really, really a, 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 an exceptional kind of achievement, in my opinion, of the, of the Android approach. Um, this, is, this entails you don't have this adoption problem of the actual protocol. Uh, your, your adoption problem becomes an app adoption problem or a marketing adoption problem. Uh, and you cannot be as concerned about the technology um, uh, 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 adoption problem. So uh, this is just a really important subtle point. Uh, it's not particularly subtle. Uh, most folks who, who work in mobile kind of immediately grok it. Um, but for a lot of decision makers, um, thinking about the differences associated with this and, and thinking about your population and how your population uh, might have more iOS or Android is, is really important in, in thinking about adoption. Uh, another kind of a simple thing that, that, that we've seen um, is that you know the the actual data associated with these these TEKs that are that are blasted out over the um, over the protocol? Uh, somewhat surprisingly, uh, uh, particularly when looking at the um, the uh, Aturi app and, and our PathCheck app, uh, we're seeing that the there's a flags component uh, uh, or set of fields um, that are implemented 
uh, in the um, iOS version uh, of Appturian Path Check that that we're that we're not seeing in the Android side, uh, and so that could be uh, it could, we we're still trying to track down exactly kind of where that's coming from. It it could be a developer error uh, on our side uh, or that tree side. It could be a, uh, a, a like implementation subtle implementation difference between Google and iOS. Uh, but you do notice that there's kind of four digits there uh, that are missing uh, and that are kind of a, 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 a not particularly important part of the protocol, um, uh, uh, but uh, are. Uh, uh, are nonetheless we're seeing kind of across apps um, some subtlety in the actual packet information itself. Um, lastly, and, and I think this really gets to their uh, the fact that Apple and Google are different organizations and uh, have different uh, approaches or philosophies and access to course location data. And so I think this has become much more important when we talk about the domains of interoperability, uh, or, or think if we're thinking about the the issues um, around um, you know whenever these this might go into the operating system level, uh, but the 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 two operating systems really have different philosophies around what developers of applications, uh, what the sort of data they can have access to when building their apps, and so. Uh, in the Apple case, uh, they're really uh, pretty adamant that users don't have access to, develop, developers don't have access to the country uh, that the phone is in uh, without, the, without allowing, um, uh, without explicit consent. The case they walked through is if a US citizen uh, decided to go to Cuba uh, whenever there was an embargo, the developer may, um, uh, the, the user might not want the developer to know that in fact that they have been to Cuba and, and as a result could be uh, uh, um, as a result could be you know punished or, 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 or face kind of legal legal concern. Uh, and so they don't allow uh, developers to have access to the country that the phone is in uh, without permission. while Google actually does allow that. Uh, Google permits uh, developers to know, uh, the country that the uh, phone is in, in order to allow um, like basic telecom uh, uh, information. There's kind of a number of practical reasons where that where that comes to play, and so as a result, I think that we're going to see that these these kind of different approaches to what types of data the developer can have access to uh, are going to be uh, reflected in kind of whenever we're thinking about what interoperability looks like, and so. Uh, in particular, I think this entails that we're going to be taking a least common denominator approach to privacy. Uh, so there'll always be parity. You'll always be able to implement this, you know, similar things in Google and Apple. Uh, and I think that you'll see that that Google needs to make sure that they're able to support Apple's uh, more stringent approach uh, and respect res respect that more stringent approach. Um, so uh, again, uh, uh, another kind of interesting uh, diversion that I think you're going to see uh, continue to play out as this protocol expands uh, and as the, the actual different OSs and, and their limitations have to navigate uh, these different implementations. So uh, that was a, a bit about uh, the, the protocol uh, and the APIs. Uh, next, we'll kind of go to a couple of uh, gotchas and pitfalls uh, and again, uh, Lena here will correct me. Um, it, she, she's she's very much the the, the domain or domain owner here. Um, so one um, you know possibility uh, to to keep track of is that for early versions uh, of the of gain applications, um, there is logic that queues off off of the operating system, uh, and there's logic that queues off of the application level around what counts as an exposure notification. And so there, there are cases where, and, and you know, given the scale we're talking about, this isn't a primary concern, but it, do, it does highlight it is possible and, and it could be uh, more substantial in certain use cases uh, where a user could get a OS level update um, saying that there was an exposure. Um, based upon kind of an OS level exposure notification uh, logic, uh, while, while they wouldn't, you know, correspond or wouldn't tie them to an app level exposure notification, 
Uh, and that just it's it's a re, it's predominantly a result of the the flexibility in the the scoring what counts as an exposure and where that logic can live. Um, and uh, we're you know we, we don't think it's going to be a larger issue, but we, we do think it is um, is is a possibility. Um, I think that the second thing to highlight, um, which it, it's it's pandemic tech, and I think it kind of goes without saying, but you know these this this is a this is a technology that was produced by Google and Apple from design to implementation or to, to release in eight weeks. Um, uh, and it's an astounding piece of technology. I, I, as I think it's a really, really, really clever uh, protocol uh, uh, in many, many ways. But uh, writing this sort of technology to be deployed by nations and states, uh, uh, and that is uh, kind of full of all sorts of kind of uh, uh, complexity uh, is means that there's uh, by working kind of on the later APIs uh, and particularly even in v1.1 for, for some time um, you you should really expect to be working with the protocol and with the developers of the protocol uh, and, and lean on them uh, uh, to, 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 to triage issues as much as possible because it's really quite um, uh, it, there is like a number of issues for instance we we started with the Google uh, reference uh, server um, key server and verification server and uh, our development was actually kind of we had to work around that for uh, three to four days due to a simple kind of certificate verification issue um, and and we've also kind of I, oh, we haven't seen one recently but but in in June and July we were even seeing kind of breaking API changes uh, on a regular basis so um, no one understand that um, these technologies while consolidation is valuable uh, understanding that you should bake in uh, a good amount of time uh, for the for the hiccups um, that will come with working with leading edge technology is is, is uh, highly recommended. Um, I think uh, another thing, and we've thought a lot about this, and um, I think this is even a bit dated. We we've learned even more from from since when I made this slide. But uh, when we originally approached this problem, we really assumed that. We would have a, a date with a capital D. It would be kind of correspond to a, a, a user's local time um, and be unable kind of a, a very natural uh, unit of measure for an individual. Uh, and in the least, I would say it's not clear that that's the case. It's not clear that uh, we can yeah, reason about a single day. Um, we're due to kind of the, the nature, the nature of the protocol and the precision allowed, and, and kind of several kind of natural limitations. Where where it's you should really think of the users knowing they have an exposure with an approximate time range, uh, and that um, that that will be kind of needing to uh, message accordingly. Um, so that's a that's a that's one that we we learned uh, and and have continued to wrestle with and, and discuss internally for some time. Um, Another thing is that we that we're, we anticipate that um, kind of due to the different operating system level constraints, uh, we do think that there's going to need going to be uh, multiple versions of the EN config file uh, as we update uh, uh, versions. So uh, this is just based upon like as new versions of the API come out, uh, new site types of scoring and objects will come. Um, but you're going to need to support that older version uh, of scoring uh, for the users, particularly on, o, uh, on iOS, who haven't updated. Um, so when you're thinking about uh, this is quickly going to uh, you know, explode in complexity uh, as we deal with more and more devices and more and more operating systems and more and more versions of the API uh, and uh, any kind of implementation or architecture that doesn't natively support that uh, uh, is is going to have a, a tough time keeping up. So, so do think uh, thoughtfully about that. Um, a last thing we had, you know, we're open source, which means that we we try to work with the best, uh, like we, we are learning from the German open source implementation, the Irish open source implementation, um, uh, the, the Swiss uh, are really wonderful thought partners for us. And I think that we originally thought like, oh, you could just, you know, bring this this whole, you know, API in very, very easily, or you could leverage this whole library of, of this project. What we're discovering is that in, in the least, uh, you know, the way in which these different um, open source implementations handle the dynamic nature of the technology, the way they handle scoring, 
um, the way they, the, where their logic lives for scoring, all of these things um, uh, are, are, have subtle implementation changes. Um, and whenever you're kind of deciding which project to work with, uh, particularly from an open source perspective, uh, it's really worth it to, to look closely uh, and look at several uh, and um, be really careful to make sure that the open source um, uh, uh, approach uh, is uh, really well set up for later versions of the API, which, with, which add uh, some important functionality. Um, so with this, I'm going to just totally hand it over to Lena. She actually coined the term uh, notification Mageddon. Um, so, and and, and the, the information on the slide might also, uh, as all of this stuff, might be a bit dated. I made this, uh, I made this a couple of days ago. Yeah, I think I'll um, kind of just start out talking not directly about notification Mageddon, uh, just how we're thinking about um, what conditions you should have for giving a user a notification. Um, so basically what everyone more or less does, including us, is to try to approximate um, or to users within two meters of each other for uh, 15 minutes or more. Um, but what that means in code, it's, it's not specific enough. So like during what time period should you aggregate? Like if you, if you had multiple people that you were exposed to for shorter periods of time, should you aggregate that? Uh, if you meet three people for five minutes in a day that were all infected, that should be the same as one person for 15 minutes probably, which is what we have arrived at. Um, so we'll, we're trying to get to, uh, did you have 15 minutes of exposure in a day? Um, and possibly there will be uh, more evolutions of that again as we learn more, but that's basically what we're trying to do. Um, and then we get to notification problems, uh, which Furthermore, ties into um, the different versions uh, for Google and Apple to some extent. Um, so we have an issue here in version one of the protocol, um, which actually means that I want us to have as many users as possible on the, the version 1.5 version of the protocol that has exposure windows, which is currently available uh, on Android. Uh, and not yet on iOS. Uh, it'll come in the new operating system version 14, which we would expect to come in mid to late September. But yeah, so the I think the version one protocol, while I'm very grateful for this like wonderful protocol that I think is very, very well designed. Um, I think the version one of it, um, has some problems here that makes it more difficult to use that are fixed in the next version, um, which I'm sure is because we were all just kind of learning quickly. Um, so the, the kind of root issue here um, is that if you want to know what day an exposure happened um, and so that you can aggregate by day or if you want to like show in a calendar or whatever, like you were exposed on, Tuesday. Um, you have two different objects that you can get information from in the version one protocol and it's exposure summary and it's exposure information. Exposure summary is a summary of whatever data you got in the latest key bundle that you downloaded. And so that could contain data for up to the last 14 days. So we don't necessarily know when an exposure happened. If you try to use exposure information, there will be an OS level notification that you can't avoid. And the API documented, Google's API documentation says that the user will get a notification saying that we requested more information, which sounds a little creepy, which is bad enough. But then when we actually look at it, I haven't seen anything about this in the iOS um, documentation, by the way, but, um, as we have actually used it and looked at it, it doesn't just say that we requested more information, but it also tells the user they had a possible COVID-19 exposure. So 
We can't use that unless possibly we have decided already that yes, they're going to get a notification. This does meet our threshold, but we just can't have the like possible COVID-19 exposure notification. And then say like, no, nah, you know, it wasn't significant enough. Don't worry about it. Like might not go over too well with users. Um, so basically, yeah. So, so basically what the Swiss did here is their um, key server bundles um, bundles the temporary exposure keys such that they are day by day by exposure. And so they're actually able to tell using only exposure summary um, what day an exposure happened. So they can tell, um, they can aggregate by day. And we consider this, but I think we're in a different situation for many reasons. One being that while the Swiss were doing this work ahead of us, we never uh, made our own, uh, they have their own exposure notification service. We don't because by the time we got to that point, Google had started making theirs. Well, it was pretty much ready to use more or less uh, when I joined the project actually. Um, so we're using theirs. And as anyone that has developed software can, can say, like if you have a thing that uh, you can just like not touch and just run uh, versus like modifying it and trying to merge things together and like maintain that over time, like better to not touch it if you can. And we will actually have some additional servers in our um, system, but we're able to keep those completely separate. So the maintenance will be much easier. So, so for us, basically, it would be more difficult to maintain to do that. But then the other thing was, well, we do have version 1.5 coming. That's like farther along. And then recently, Apple updated their documentation saying like, yes, this is coming. And we now have like an idea of when it is coming. So we didn't think it would be worthwhile to do this implementation, even though I do think I, I do think it's the better one if you have like you know infinite time and resources. So basically, what we're trying to do instead is just to approximate, like do the best that we can with the information that we have in the exposure summary, which could be valid for like up to fourteen days of exposure. So we don't cost notifications. We want all users to be on the newer version of the protocol with exposure windows when we can, where we no longer have this problem. Um, but yeah, I think there's basically like a few things that you can look at in the exposure summary that um, allows you to figure out in a bit more detail, like even if, if it were uh, exposures from a single user in a single day, you actually will be able to know. Um, so we're just kind of like trying to figure out um, a good approximation there that won't be perfect in every single case. Um, of course, nor is any of this. It's not like you will automatically get infected if you're within two meters for 15 minutes, but you won't if you're at 2.1 meters and like 14 minutes. So, um, but yeah, so we have a slight approximation there. Um, I actually don't expect this case to be super common, especially as, you know, it'll be more the users that when the new operating system is out, it'll be like the users that didn't upgrade their operating system on iOS. And then out of those, how many actually had like multiple exposures? Um, it's kind of limited, but it's still kind of an important problem to solve. Um, go ahead, Sam. Cool. Thanks, Lena. Um, yeah, so we with the with Tommy of Love, we'll kind of dive into the, the the verification server. Another thing that we've been thinking a lot about, and just kind of going to surface some of the the challenges we're seeing. I'm, I'm really excited for the discussion later about um, uh, about what um, how different states and nations are, are navigating these trade offs. Um, th the first to highlight is if you're going to be kind of integrating uh, with the actual kind of user interface for the verification service. Um, 
you really want to make sure that your identity management integrates with whoever is going to be doing um, the uh, doing the actual uh, transmission of code. So uh, we're seeing um, in in one state uh, they have uh, a central state identity management system, but their manual contact tracing is actually done at a local level with a different identity management system. And so um, we're 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 similarly seeing in a, in another jurisdiction. Um, uh, comparable fragmentation. Um, uh, so uh, it's very kind of uh, important um, if you're going to be leveraging kind of a, a user flow uh, to, to get a lay of the land for how existing manual contact tracers are working, uh, what tools they're working in, and what in particular identity management uh, is, is, is happening and occurring across the state or nation, um, because you're going to want need to integrate with a number of those solutions in order to kind of scale effectively. Uh, this kind of it's on issue two here of centralized versus decentralized. Uh, the the kind of uh, major challenges and in, in testing uh, and manual contact tracing systems themselves mean that um, this isn't the sort of thing that you can kind of uh, have the governor decree will be the case uh, and it necessarily becomes the case immediately uh, because they're so. Uh, diffuse systems, often decentralized systems, can be really hard to instantiate the same, you know, script or the same um, uh, communication standards uh, around the state. And so uh, be really careful in understanding uh, and mapping out how testing and manual contact tracing both function, what institutions are involved, uh, and be sure to kind of have both top-down buy-in for the approach, but also as much as possible uh, bottoms up uh, buy-in as well, um, because ultimately it is manual contact tracers, many of which who have just been hired for this job uh, and who are asked to do a number of things who are going to be needing to make sure to communicate this information and speak to it confidently. And so starting with that user, uh, making sure that there, there's buy-in there is, is really, really key. Um, I think uh, comparably to this, there's a interesting tension, uh, not necessarily a trade-off, but it's certainly a tension uh, between how quickly you can get the code sent to a user uh, and the engagement associated with uh, the user actually completing that. So by speed, we mean wouldn't it's really valuable to get these exposure notifications as quickly as possible, which means that you need to communicate the status of the testing status uh, to an individual as quickly as possible as well. And so you might say, oh, we'll produce this automated system that sends out an SMS uh, and that they'll engage with uh, and they can upload it you know, as quickly as possible. And I think that that really does optimize for um, getting that, um, getting, you know, working further and further up the, the transmission um, history. But what we're finding is that actually high engagement, a discussion with a person explaining the code explaining how the system works again, explaining how the, the contribution is valuable to the community at large, to that COVID-19 positive individual, which results in higher engagement. And so uh, when thinking about your verification server, ver verifying that individuals in fact COVID-19 positive, you wanna work really quickly, but you also wanna keep a high touch. Uh, and so we, we have some learnings uh, and our, our approach really tries to to blend those two uh, constraints together, uh, at least in some jurisdictions, but it's going to be it's going to be pretty uh, dynamic uh, and something that that you'll want to to be very thoughtful about if you if you want high engagement and early early uh, transmission um, uh, of these exposure notifications. Um, two two kind of quick things uh, where I know we're coming close on time is just that understand uh, that state. Uh, resources are drastically uh, uh, overworked uh, and are have been scaled in some cases 10x. Um, so they are dealing with brand new technologies. Multiple technology providers um, are were woefully understaffed before this uh, and are and are now having to, to modify really quickly. And so I think when you're when you're when you're when you're working with a manual contact tracing flow making sure that you're, you're not anticipating that the user has education or context, really providing as much as possible in their workflow uh, is really, really essential uh, to enabling it being completed well. Uh, it's, uh, these, these, these workforces are, 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 are highly 
um, highly pressed for time uh, and highly um, um, recently scaled. Um, lastly, I think that um, the uh, we're, our approach, uh, which which I, many uh, many of the European apps uh, actually haven't haven't taken, is that you know the gathering that exposure notification feedback um, and kind of being able to close the loop on. Uh, on what information the system is generating, what exposures are being sent, uh, is really, really, really important. I think it's important to think about what our exposure notification will be to start. It's important to think about what our offering will be to start, but um, all of this technology and all of these settings are likely to evolve uh, as we learn more about the disease uh, and in different contexts and different jurisdictions. And so making sure that you have a closed loop system um, that enables epidemiologists to understand, uh, even in, 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 in an aggregate and privacy preserving way, what uh, exposure notifications are being sent and, 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 and what, along like what features of those exposure notifications include, will enable the whole system to evolve more quickly uh, in this very dynamic environment. Um, I'm just gonna skip this last thing. Uh, we only have two minutes left. Uh, so we'll, we'll pass this, but, uh, this is a, a, a quick note, you know, our, our team is, is really quite blessed to have a lot of interesting research capacity as well. Uh, we're an MIT spin out uh, and have a ton of really, really talented uh, uh, people who are, who are thinking about what the future uh, of this looks like. Um, uh, we are still number one on the, on the NIST challenge um, uh, and also kind of um, uh, have, have noted um, some really interesting and powerful changes um, that, that Google has made in making sure that the RF calibration um, um, between devices is, is taken into account. Um, so uh, understand that there is, uh, you know, um, sensor level uh, and instrumentation level work going on by Apple and Google uh, and are honored to contribute to the effort uh, in our way as well. Um, I think I will... Uh, uh, I will quickly highlight um, that that with v1.5 coming, um, we, we there's uh, as Lena said, we really, really strongly advocate that uh, to move there as quickly as possible and potentially even kind of uh, deploy there. Uh, there's a number of important changes around symptoms, around infectiousness, um, around the notification issues that Lena highlighted, uh, and um, some, some interesting challenges around federation that still need to be knocked out. That's kind of the sharing of data between uh, states. Um, but on the whole, it, it addresses a number of, of gaps. I think my only small developer acts to grind is that I would not, uh, they're calling it a negative test. Um, uh, and I would call that a, a revoked test. So the, the actual kind of semantics of a negative test is it takes down keys or it removes keys. Um, but as most epidemiologists will tell you, a negative test, a positive test, and a negative test um, does not necessarily mean uh, that, that, that the result is that you uh, are, in fact, COVID-19 um, uh, negative. Um, and so uh, really, my only kind of encouragement is to, in communicating and explaining this protocol to health authorities to, to be very particular about that point. It's, it's tripped a couple of folks up on our end. So... Uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, uh, we're at time. Um, it's been uh, a whirlwind, um, uh, and um, we're we're really here uh, to to work uh, with any states. Um, some states have approached us to use our server. Some states have used approached us to use our verification server. Uh, some states want us to build everything. Some states want us to think alongside them. Uh, we are here to help, uh, and um, uh, we're really passionate and believe this technology can combat the pandemic and are, are appreciated in teaching and learning from others uh, around the nation and the world. Thanks much. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Lena, for that uh, wonderful tutorial on the app and the server. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Parish uh, Dave um, from Reuters, who has been writing some really insightful articles on gain, its adoption, some of the pitfalls and so on. And Parish is going to invite a fantastic panel of uh, states that are already in the in the game game, as we call it. Parish. Great. Thanks, Ramesh. Uh, and appreciate you having me today. 
Um, so I wanted to, you know, talk to a, a few states. Uh, we have Alabama, North Dakota, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Washington uh, representatives here today. Um, and wanted to learn, you know, a little bit about the, the progress you guys have made, challenges you faced, um, and, you know, what's next. So uh, maybe first we can go, uh, I'm getting a lot of echo on my end, but uh, maybe we can go to Virginia first and hear a little bit about uh, why gain, uh, what the costs have been, and, you know, since you guys are the first state out with a statewide rollout, um, you know, how you were able to get there uh, pretty quickly. Um, and then we'll bounce around to some of the other states as well. Sure, Parish. Hi, Jeff Stover here uh, from Virginia. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. Uh, yeah, so, so we were first to release, you know, it wasn't a race on our end. Uh, it just so happened that we were ready to go. Um, <clears throat> but, but I think we, we got there partly because we had been working on evaluating various developers and vendors who were coming out of the woodwork, as everyone knows, uh, back in March and April, saying that, you know, they had these fantastic plans for, for apps. So we started doing a lot of evaluations on them back then. Uh, and during that same time, we also, you know, we, we had demos of very flashy apps that, you know, tracked location everywhere you went. Um, and, and they looked great, right? They were nice and shiny, uh, but <clears throat> it really wasn't gonna be what was gonna take off. So uh, as, we, as we evaluated lots of them, you know, Google and Apple were at the same time working on their framework. So by the time they released their framework, we had already come to the decision based on evaluation of lots of other um, apps or, or developer presentations of what avenue we wanted to go. So by the time that happened, uh, we had decided that really, you know, focusing on an app that we can drive home the messages about public trust, uh, we're going to be critical. Uh, and that meant, you know, we're not tracking your location. We're not collecting your personally identifiable information. We can do this without collecting those things. That doesn't mean everyone's bought into it. There's lots of skeptics out there still. Uh, but it's part of our marketing campaign to be transparent about what we're doing, how we're doing it, and why we're doing it. Uh, so, so that's how we got where we were. And I think because we had done a lot of that evaluation up front, you know, we, we were in a good place to, to kick off, you know, with a developer pretty much, you know, as, as soon as, uh, the Google and Apple framework was out there, we were, we already had laid all the groundwork, uh, and started on development pretty much straight away. And what have the lessons been in the first week? Um, so I think, so we've, we've had, as of yesterday, we've had a little over 316,000 downloads. Um, and, you know, if we look at that as a proportion of that certain population, you know, the, the, those that we think have mobile devices, 80% of those, et cetera, and use that as a denominator, we're looking at what we think is around 7.5% adoption at the moment as of the end of week one. Um, so where does that put you? You know, that according to what Google would tell you, that puts you on the low end of adoption, right? Um, but we don't have anything to compare that to in the US. We have other countries that have different um, societal norms, et cetera, and some of them have had great adoption, that's wonderful. Uh, but we don't really know what our adoption rate looks like across the country yet. Maybe ours is in the middle of the road, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, we don't really know. Uh, so I think that's that's something for just for us to keep an eye out on and see what's happening. Um, I would say that you know a lesson, uh, something that we're we're seeing occur is that we've had very good response across the state. There, it, there was a huge media blitz about this. Over, uh, I think close to thirteen hundred uh, media outlet coverages over the, over the state and other parts of the country during the first like three days. Uh, it was, it was blanketed pretty hard. Uh, but there's still a large proportion of people who don't know what it is or, or have different ideas of what they think it is. So we're finding, even though people have been very supportive, um, as a general rule, there's always going to be those pundits and a few skeptics, right? We've gotten a few of those comments too, but by and large, I'd say, 95% of the comments we've gotten back have been very supportive. 
uh, and you know, I've downloaded it. I'm, I'm really proud to be a Virginian that we were out in front, those kind of things. Right. Um, but there's, we were, we're obviously figuring out that word of mouth is incredibly important here, even though this is largely a digital marketing campaign because of what it is. Um, word of mouth matters as we talk to people on an individual basis. You know, we turn people from, I would never do that into please send me the information, right? Uh, so then they can go talk to their family and friends, right? But that's a slow process. Uh, so, so I think after your initial launch and you get whatever that bump is up front, from there on, you know, it's going to be incredibly important to, it's going to be a grassroots movement in a sense to continue to push that adoption forward. And thanks, Jeff. And uh, Sue, I think, uh, in Alabama, you're starting first with students uh, and then going wider. Uh, tell me a little bit more about that approach. And then Taylor, if you wanna jump in about uh, with any sort of technical challenges that you've run in, uh, you know, in the sort of initial trials with students. Sure, and um, thanks for having me here today. This is exciting to, um, to hear what everyone's doing and, and all the progress that's been made. Um, so we had a, uh, we started a closed pilot last week of anyone with an EDU uh, email address. So uh, students, faculty, alums, um, and we have actually gotten some pretty good feedback. Um, most of the feedback so far has been around the difficulty downloading the app through the testing process. Um, and so we expect uh, all of that to go away once people can actually download it in a mechanism that they're used to downloading it through, like, you know, through the, uh, the, the app markets. And so, um, so that's actually been, uh, been really good. And we're looking forward to, uh, to going live uh, uh, statewide uh, on Monday. And so that's uh, what our, our plan is. Um, so that's actually been going going great. And I'm happy to comment on any other uh, issues as well, if you would like me to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, what, what sort of is changing from the um, EDU version to the statewide version? Are there any advancements and tweaks that you guys had to make? So it's, it's not that there's a different version. Uh, what we, uh, what Apple and Google uh, asked us to do was test more broadly than what we had tested previously. And, uh, and so in order to do that, we had to figure out, well, how do we get a, uh, a test base and what would be a logical test base? And what did we think would be a test base that would, um, that would be likely to test? Like, you know, who, who mostly has a tolerance for testing? And so with, um, we have been doing a big push to the school environment because of the GuideSafe platform under which this falls. And so because all of the schools know about the GuideSafe platform, we figured that would be a logical environment within which to launch uh, a closed pilot. So, uh, so we had a press event last week and, uh, and, and launched that um, through there. So nothing is changing unless there were a little testing glitches that people noticed, like, um, like there was a, a spacing issue on, on the Android. Um, those things are easy to fix. Um, but in terms of other things, uh, functionality and, uh, and design, everything is all the same. Um, the one thing that, that will actually be active that is not active in the test version, uh, we have a link back to our GuideSafe Health Check. That now will actually go to GuideSafe Health Check. Um, it didn't actually go there because uh, we didn't have that page developed yet uh, for all the different institutions across the state, but now we do. So uh, come Monday, that will all be, uh, that will all be live. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, to Sue or Taylor, are you finding uh, sort of that it's working? Like, I mean, our exposure notifications going out. Uh, and then second, you know, now that there'll potentially be two states with, with apps out in the wild, you know, do you plan to connect to uh, a national server, you know, potentially run by the Association of Public Health Labs? Um, and, you know, if a Virginian comes over to Alabama, Will the you know apps communicate? 
Yeah, so we uh, we have definite plans uh, to connect to the national server. We've been talking about it for a while. In fact, I, I will echo what Jeff said earlier in terms of our thought process and laying this out um, uh, all the way from, you know, gee, how do we develop this? Who do we use? And then Apple, Google had their framework. It's like, okay, let's just go with that. We had all that laid out. We've been talking about how do we do this at a national level, certainly more broadly um, since that point in time. So that would probably be um, early May, I think. And so we're excited about the, about the national server. Um, we're excited to be part of that. We think that there's a great need for these states to be able to communicate because um, uh, hopefully before too long, we will be a mobile society once again. Right now we're kind of all, uh, you know, uh, relegated to staying at home. But, um, but in the educational environment, those students are gonna come and go. So those students are gonna go home to their home states uh, so let's take the example that you just gave. If we have Alabama students that go home to Virginia and then they come back to Alabama, wouldn't it be nice if there were some communication and vice versa? You know, let's say we have somebody at VCU who lives in Birmingham. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to have that communication of exposure at a much greater level? And so we're definitely planning on that. We're definitely um, uh, looking forward to that. And we, we think that we have a pretty unique and novel verification service um, that is uh, different than other states, what they're employing. And we think that that can, can help with, um, with using this nationwide. Okay, anything you'd add, Taylor? Uh, Sue's, pretty, Sue's covered it pretty well <laughs> the okay. whole way through. Um, I may talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges we faced along the way um, we got we started on the project really early. We started back in the beginning of May um, was the first conversation between motion mobs and UAB to work on building the app. And at that point, things were still changing very quickly. <laughs> um, we were built, you know, we started building towards a certain API spec and that was, that was great. And then they changed a few things and we had to go back in <laughs> and adapt to these, uh, the changes along the way. And now we're seeing, um, the ongoing changes that we're, you know, we've talked a little bit about that Sam and Lena talked a little bit about with um, uh, version 1.5 and the incoming version 1.6, um, the changes that will be necessary along the way there as well. It's uh, rapidly uh, changing. <laughs> and so uh, those have been kind of the biggest challenges uh, once we got started with everything. But um, otherwise it's been, it's been great to get to work on such a significant project and be a part of this. You know, both the motion ops team just individually, it's it's maybe incredibly proud. Okay. And I think the, the thing that I would add to what Taylor said is one of our biggest challenges was also one of our biggest successes. One of our biggest challenges was figuring out how to work within the processes that fit our current health department. So somebody said earlier that you know, the, the current, the health departments in the current state, they're overwhelmed, they're underwater. They can't even think about this. They just can't think, and they can't think about another thing. And, uh, and so we had to work within those constraints and those processes. And so, so one of the things that we, and that was a challenge. And the verification service within that, kind of as a subset of their processes, became an additional challenge. And so then the question for our team became, how do we take their processes and make them work for us without them having to actually do any work and, and, and actually augment their processes and help them be more efficient? And so what we started to look at is which of their processes are predictable and repeatable? And then we took those processes and said, all right, how can we develop to those predictable and repeatable processes? And one of those things, as I mentioned, was the verification service, which, um, which somebody had, had mentioned earlier, I think Sam mentioned earlier, you know, the sooner, the earlier you can get the notification, the better off you are um, for all the obvious reasons. And, uh, and so initially uh, our verification service with them was nightly. We got a nightly uh, dump of data and because that's what fit their process at the time. Um, then as their processes started to mature and they started to get more people on board, 
um, there became a window of opportunity for us to go back to, to them and say, now we would like to vis revisit with you how often we get the data. And um, so now we get those data hourly. And so our, our um, notifications are actually much, much faster uh, than they were a week ago. And so that's, that's some great news on, on our side and it's great news for people in our state, but it also shows how we, how we were able to take something that was really a significant challenge at the very beginning and turn it into um, to a success and then how we ran with it. Thanks, Sue. And I know, Brian, uh, you know, uh, with Washington, you've also been doing a trial uh, and, you know, what have been some of the takeaways from that? Uh, uh, and tell us a little bit more about that as well. Sure. Um, the, uh, we've been in Washington State. Um, we partnered with the University of Washington and the Paul Allen School of uh, Computer Science, as well as volunteers from uh, uh, the uh, global, uh, School of uh, Medicine, School of Public Health, and the Global Health Program. Um, uh, so a really diverse set and team that helped uh, develop an open source app that's uh, called commoncircle.us. Um, and that, um, that team has piloted now successfully. We did a, a two week pilot um, in a group of essential workers. Um, and a very, uh, very key in the set, a key set of essential workers is in the labor and delivery unit at the uh, uh, UW Medical Center. Um, and uh, we're still analyzing the data from the, the trial implementation, but uh, it looks really promising. Um, uh, it's a, uh, as you can imagine, um, it's a very intimate setting in labor and delivery. So people are very close to each other. So we, we did successfully see a lot of uh, uh, exposure notifications and the way we ran it as a uh, uh, trial, as we described it, a we ran uh, two fire drills each day, uh, artificially um, telling somebody for the purpose of this uh, test implementation, um, you've been randomly selected to to be our positive case for the day, and then uh, see how uh, that uh, exposure notification propagated. And it's really fascinating. Um, the labor and delivery and recovery are on two separate floors, and uh, there's some interesting crossover of personnel between the floors. So it's um, um, uh, remarkable and uh, uh, really promising in the way that it it helped people to, uh, you know, we compared it to the gold standard of uh, uh, recall for traditional contact tracing, and uh, we're able to confirm our hypothesis is that people don't remember everybody that they were near during a given day. So um, really um, fascinating preliminary results we hope to be publishing soon with the UW, with our UW colleagues. Um, do you think you had some false negatives as well where uh, the app wasn't picking up contacts that had actually happened or did you find it was pretty reliable? So that, that's a really good question. Um, we, it, that's a hard question to answer uh, and we don't have a true gold standard of, you know, cameras in the labor and delivery ward to <laughs> Uh, monitor who people were actually near and for how long. Um, uh, I wish I could answer uh, that in a true in a true sense. But what we do, what we are seeing is that it is picking up cases of true exposure that we wouldn't have otherwise known about, and that's that's the that's what we think will be the indication that this is worth doing. Um, um, and what does the timeline look from here to, to going statewide and, and what do you still need to, to prove out or adjust in the app uh, to get there? Yeah, so I think that that's where um, the charge that I have from the Secretary of Health and from the governor's office is to um, evaluate the technology and uh, proceed with, with evidence that um, um, before we move forward. And the, 
the body that's doing that um, assessment um, was formed as an independent oversight, uh, an advisory body um, pulled together so that we're um, evaluating the, the results of this trial. They'll be uh, hearing about that on Monday and then giving advice to the Department of Health on uh, the path forward. Um, I think uh, the University of Washington, independently from a statewide rollout, is evaluating the technology for their own purposes in terms of uh, use on campus. Um, so that that is proceeding um, independently. Um, but from a statewide standpoint, uh, we're uh, awaiting the the results from from this, um, as well as uh, anxiously waiting to see what happens in the, in other states that are that are proceeding ahead with statewide rollouts. Gotcha. Uh, well, thanks, Brian and Vern and, and Tim out in North Dakota. Um, wanted to talk to you guys a bit about sort of the, the policy challenges. As sort of Brian alluded to with the advisory committee, you know, obviously North Dakota came out with. Uh, one type of app and then decided to take advantage of the, the gain system as well. Um, so what progress have you made there? And, you know, what sort of are you trying to navigate through to make sure, uh, you know, that the public accepts this app, lawmakers accept this app? Um, uh, you know, walk me through some of the, the thinking from the policy side, perhaps, Vern. Okay, I can talk a little bit about um, the policy side, and I'm going to leave the technology discussion to Tim. But from a policy side um, or standpoint, we've been very fortunate that right at the outset, um, we had the support of our governor. Our governor gets the importance of this technology. We also had the support of our chief health officer who leads the health department. So those were two things right out of the, the chute that made it um, a little easier for us to navigate. Um, initially, you know, before the Apple Google um, announcement, uh, we elected to proceed um, with the location based and and that app um, has been released. It's been out there for several months and I'll I'll let Tim talk about that. But when when the Apple Google announcement came out, uh, we made a decision to uh, not do an either or. Uh, but of both um, and leave it to the citizens as to which technology they preferred, which technology they felt would be more effective and, and which they felt more, would be more comfortable. So um, that's, that's the path we're going down. The, the thing that the reason that we're really excited about uh, the Bluetooth technology, the proximity approach is, as you would imagine, the, um, the demographics of North Dakota would be very different than, than Virginia. In some places, uh, GPS is probably more effective. Um, but as we began working with our university system, a task force was um, established to uh, kind of put our heads together from the university system, realizing that um, in a typical contact tracing, the manual contact tracing um, mechanism that is in place and that we use extensively, uh, the average um, positive case in North Dakota right now has between six and 10 contacts that are being traced. Uh, when we move to a college setting, as you can imagine, that number increases a great deal. Um, our, the, the test sites that we've looked at and the, and the data that we're analyzing um, tell us that those could very easily, the contacts could really easily, easily be 30 or 40 per positive case. So very early you start doing the math and uh, that is gonna bring, although the contact tracing infrastructure in North Dakota, they've stood up a new IT system. They have uh, increased the number of tracers by 600% and are still hiring and training. Uh, but when you start looking at onboarding all of the college students, basically within a couple week time frame into that environment, you know that that could get out of hand quite quickly. And so there was a real urgency on our part to make sure that um, this app was ready. And uh, there's an extensive advertising campaign that actually begins today that um, says two things, get tested and download the app. Um, the health department has set up 64 static locations around the state where any citizen can go in, be tested, it's free. Um, symptomatic, asymptomatic. Uh, we're encouraging the students to be tested 
and get their results prior to arriving on campus. Um, so if they have to quarantine, uh, they do that at home rather than um, doing that on campus. So that is, is really kind of the strategy. And, and from the beginning, we tried to remove all the obstacles and in that rather than universities negotiating individually with the developer and early on, uh, the Department of Health selected ProudCrowd and that has been a fantastic partnership and, and Tim uh, will speak to that. But um, we uh, decided to take the approach where the Department of Health executed a single contract with ProudCrowd that covers all universities in the state um, there's also um, discussions going on with the Department of Public Instruction, which uh, includes all K-12, little different situation. But basically what the governor and the Department of Health have done is cleared away all the obstacles. There's no charge. There's no contractual ob obstacles by university. Um, Proud Crowd has been uh, really good in working with us in making that happen. So uh, we're really excited to be at this point. We think that this technology is going to be absolutely critical in um, all of these students retain, uh, returning to the classroom and keeping these classrooms open. Uh, we know that nothing, you know, nothing is bulletproof. Masks aren't, testing isn't, tracing isn't, technology isn't. But we look at this as, as one more layer of protection for a vulnerable population. In some cases, that's the, um, the professors in the classroom and also uh, protecting our students and our citizens, their livelihood mm -hmm. and um, our ability to, to keep our economy open. Thanks, Vern. And so Tim, uh, I mean, I'm curious to hear as working on a gain app and a, non, and a couple of non-gain apps, what are you sort of, uh, seeing his shortcomings still in the Google Apple system? And are there any big asks, asks that you have out to, to Apple and Google, you know, for, for additional flexibility, additional metadata that you can play around with? Yep, so uh, first first to make the announcement, Vern alluded to downloading the app, but we today is launch day for uh, okay. Care 19 Alert in North Dakota. And we are launching on the APHL key server um, we are the first app to launch on a national key server. And in fact, we waited a bit so that we could launch on the key server. And so that's great news. We'll be launching on, in, on Wyoming uh, tomorrow. And so we have North Dakota and Wyoming as, as clients. Um, I think the interesting part around uh, the technology part or the policy part with Apple and Google is Care 19 is a platform. We have one app and it's completely data-driven. So to onboard a new state, we just can reconfigure our back end. And the very first screen on the app is a state picker. When you load the app, you say, please select your region and you pick your state and then the app configures to that state. Um, Apple and Google have more been envisioning a one app for one state model. And so there's been occasions where we've had to work through some things, but you know, we've gotten through that and that's been fine. Though the other thing I'd like to touch on is Vern mentioned the universities and the education. And, and I'd like to just give some context to why that matters. Um, I think as, a, as we went through the use cases, I mean, at it, it, some level, it's really simple. The entire app pretty much exists to deliver a notification. And the notification, the value in that is the instructions you deliver. It's like, kind of like, duh. It's all about the instructions. And it's harder than you think because you start out just thinking, oh, we'll load the standard set of, you know, Department of Health state instructions into the app and we're good. But then I'm talking to the universities, trying to convince them to, you know, promote the app amongst their students. And I'm showing them demos and, the, and they look at the instructions and they go, those are not the right instructions. Those are instructions for a general citizen. If a student gets a notification, we want to tell them that they should go to the campus health center to get their COVID test because it's free there, not the general instructions. We want to tell them return to class actions, right? That they should not attend class and that they should call dining services and we'll have meals delivered. And none of that information is in the standard state instructions. And so it's interesting because uh, it's completely aligned with privacy. A GAN app can ask questions as long as they're voluntary. You can ask, for example, you can ask the user if they have diabetes or high blood pressure because the instructions you might deliver might be different. Well, what we did is we asked the user voluntarily, are you a student or faculty member? And so if you'll allow me, I'll share a screenshot because this visualization goes a long way. There's this screen in the app called Affiliates. And 
it defaults on the left to nothing, just explaining that you can select an affiliate. And if you select select button, we have every higher education institution in North Dakota loaded into the app. And you can voluntarily just say, I am affiliated with say North Dakota State University. I am a student faculty or staff. That's not identifying information. You're just saying you're one of 15,000. And then once you pick an institution, we show the screen on the right, which says, this is what happens. If you choose to join this affiliate, first off, you get the, the, the middle instruction, custom return to class actions. That's where you're going to get instructions that show you should you know, go to the campus health center. The first one, though, also usage monitoring. The state is choosing to go with the CDC sort of six feet for 15 minutes. But higher ed, in some cases, said, no, we also want a classroom environment setting, where if it's a longer distance for a longer time, because kids have been in a classroom with each other, we'd also like that. And so if you join an affiliate, they can actually expand the state settings in a classroom environment to also have a longer distance setting. And then the university can also get aggregate usage monitoring. So they can actually get an idea of not only how many students and faculty are loading the app and using it, they can also get information on actually how many notifications they're getting across the campus. Again, just in aggregate form. And so then what happens is, is when you get, sorry, when you get an exposure on the left, you've been exposed to someone with COVID-19 recently, you hit the instructions. If you, if you just download it as a state citizen, you go straight to the state instructions. But if you've affiliated, you get the screen that says you have instructions from multiple institutions. Please read them all. You always get the state instructions. I affiliated with North Dakota State, so I can also see their instructions as well. And their instruction might say, oops, I don't have it in here. But their instruction may say, oh, here you go. The Campus Health Center offers free COVID testing, right? And I just set this up as an example. Again, it might be called dining services to get meals delivered to your dorm, you know, all the instructions that would be relevant to your affiliation. And so I think that's one of the things that really makes us unique is that being able to deliver really targeted and relevant instructions based on, and the affiliation doesn't have to be higher ed, it could be business, it could even be jurisdiction based. If your different jurisdictions in your state have different policies, you could affiliate with the jurisdiction. Uh, in your state as well. So we think this is a really positive and it's just part of the CARE 19 platform. Great, I mean, that's a uh, super instructive visual, Tim, thank you. Uh, and then Larry, thanks for your patience, wanted to jump to Pennsylvania last. Um, tell me, uh, you know, I'm less familiar with, with sort of Pennsylvania's plans and, uh, you know, what's coming. Uh, sort of give us an overview and, and tell us a little bit about some of the ex experience and, and lessons that you've gathered in, in Europe and uh, what you're bringing over here to the US. Yeah, no problem, thanks. So uh, Larry Breen from, from Nearform, so obviously we're working with Pennsylvania in terms of their deployment. Um, we're also working with a, a number of other states and countries worldwide. So at this stage, we've got either, I think we're up to now nine countries either in production um, and live and operational. Um, or due to go live in, in the coming weeks. Um, we set the first project live six, seven weeks ago now, so first country live, uh, and we've obviously continued to roll forwards on that. From a Pennsylvania point of view, uh, their selection process, so they, uh, you know, they did an extensive selection process and, and, and obviously went through quite a lot of, of understanding. And, and what we were able to do is uh, bring folks from Pennsylvania and, and other interested parties together with those countries that are already, you know, a month or two ahead. So again, share those kind of learnings. So all the folks that have kind of gone before have talked about the level of um, testing and, and data protection and looking at all that kind of, of, of side of it, which is of paramount importance. Um, because obviously we've been able to get these products out to the citizenry, uh, you know, sort of two months ago, there's a lot of learnings already starting to come in from that. Um, We've also had a lot of work done on the, um, you know, data protection. We've had a lot of universities involved in looking at the underlying, the code, the security mechanisms, and, and making sure that it is, uh, it is what we say it is, and, and therefore, from a data protection point of view and, and privacy point of view, uh, it, it's 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 relatively straightforward. Um, one of the key pieces and one of the key attracting pieces is from the very first deployment um, in Europe, and obviously, we'll continue that mandate going forwards. Is uh, we've published everything that we've found as we've gone through it with our clients. So again, made it open to all public. 
um, all parties to actually come in and have a look at it, including the underlying code. So again, we've open sourced all the code throughout and again, making sure everything was, was clearly available. So from that point of view, it's allowed uh, you know, Pennsylvania and other states to obviously make a more informed decision about what it is they're actually getting, learning and leveraging some of the testing and, and uh, experiences that they've had from those that have gone before them. And again, by getting into that sort of collaborative approach and discussion is again, continuously building upon a firm foundation and, and sharing and, and improving. So um, that culminated in, uh, you know, the COVID Green project uh, that we released up to the Linux Foundation Public Health. Uh, again, making it available for anybody to come in and either use and avail of it, happy, um, or for a lot of, and, and again, some of the speakers have talked about uh, those people that have, you know, negative comments or criticism. What we've found with the deployments that we've done so far is those, uh, those negative comments and criticism have, have kind of died away very quickly because it's, uh, it's beyond transparent. Um, obviously, those folks have been able to come in and actually scrutinize every aspect of what's going on. And, and are left with no areas in terms of privacy, security. It is what it says it does. There are no risks and, and, and they're very comfortable with it. So um, that kind of makes it super fast. Um, and, and, you know, the other key piece to it is it now allows us to, you know, spin up additional governments and states, you know, in sort of a four week window from a standing start, which just allows people to again, continue to build on all the successes that have gone before them. And one specific question for you, Larry. Uh, I mean, in Ireland, you've released a lot of data, as you said, about sort of usage of the app and, and the notification sent out. Should we expect that in Pennsylvania as well? Or will there be any big uh, differences between the, the Irish version of the app and the, the Pennsylvania app? Yeah, so fundamentally, you know, the fundamentals that sit underneath are obviously common. And, and that obviously gives that uh, shared experience and, and obviously that wealth of knowledge for, for going forwards. But we do build the apps on a state by state basis because there are state nuances that obviously need to be factored in. They have their own policies and procedures. And, and again, we want them not just in the here and now, obviously, you know, expediency and, and get to market is super important. But obviously, over the duration of, of these projects and, and, and COVID 19, we need them to have the flexibility to deal with their own citizenry's needs. So, so they are individuals. So there are some differences, but the fundamentals kind of are the same. Uh, and, and, and that's really important in terms of how we actually charge it forward. In terms of the open and transparency, yeah. Um, all of our clients that are coming board, again, have found that to be a real sort of bolster in, in terms of getting that level of adoption. And we saw within, so if we take the Republic of Ireland launch, uh, we saw within the first week, sort of we, we achieved an excess of 20% of population adoption. We're now up above 40% adoption. Um, we're seeing the similar uh, in Gibraltar, who were the very first country to go live. You know, Northern Ireland, who went live last week, you know, they're tracking on those similar kind of numbers. And we expect to sort of maintain that based on, you know, the fact that people can see, they understand what's underneath it and gets rid of those, you know, concerns and skepticisms, which were one of the primary, primary issues. Great. Right. Thanks, Larry. And I uh, wanted to kick it to Ramesh, who I think had a couple of questions, perhaps as well. Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you all for joining. I think Sam, do you want to say just a couple of sentences? I know we are almost out of time. Just your experiences and anything you want to respond to this. Yeah, it was wonderful to hear and, and see so many people thinking about so many different, um, very very similar ideas and solving very similar problems. I think my 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 only uh, kind of comment or, or or question just revolves around. I think one of the interesting tensions is kind of multi-state, single state. How do you how do you deploy quickly? Uh, and in particular, understanding a bit about like legal constraints that that vary across states and across nations, uh, which which I think can uh, complicate these models uh, and is an important discussion. Um, uh, love to hear some like how 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 that legal and, and, and compliance uh, issue is, is is explored. But maybe that's a conversation for another time. Yeah, just a, a quick one on that, Simon. And they are kind of good points. Um, Again, the whole key to it, and again, we've gone down that model of having a, a full standalone system for each state, but it is effectively, you know, regurgitation of, of what's going on before with some nuances, and it allows to facilitate the specific needs of each of those states as they go forwards. Again, bringing a lot of that research and, and, and investigation and those reports from, as, as we go through these deployments, as we say, we're, we're now on number nine, obviously, they're able to share that. They may not necessarily be relevant to the 
to the uh, the state or the government that we're actually going live with it, but it's a it's a supporting piece of, of information. When we get to the whole interoperability, so um, again, from a, a near form point of view, we've obviously built a full interoperability service. So if we look in Europe, we're already acting between different countries and, and we're facilitating that. But we also have the switches available to switch across to the uh, European Federation server. The same is happening over here in, in the US is obviously we have interoperability already built into those systems that we're just about to take live. But again, we'll bring in APHL and, and above that. So that piece is also being built. So it's about creating that flexibility, but within that, you know, that single channel per state. Yeah. Anybody else wants to respond to that uh, comment? Yeah, I, I think that um, just to emphasize, the uh, APHL is uh, an organization that is already a well-established and trusted third party with every state and territory in the U.S. So I think um, partnering with them as our, our hub for a uh, key exchange between jurisdictions and between, you know, competing approaches, competing vendors, competing open source projects. Um, we should not be competing on the key exchange methodology. And I think that that's where it'll become critical that we are, we're interoperable um, between states, you know, our, assuming that our borders ever become fluid again, um, we'll, we'll, need, we'll need that capability. Yeah. If I can ask the if I can ask the question that uh, Tim partially covered to Jeff in Virginia uh, about how you're thinking about universities and other places and are they also stakeholders in Virginia? I think you're on mute, Jeff. Can I missed the first part of your question? Could you just repeat it? I was just asking, uh, just as Tim was describing in North Dakota. Uh, are our universities also stakeholders in the yeah in yeah yeah uh, so we did demos for all of our institutions of higher ed early on uh, when I say early on it's when we had just started doing some beta testing so they saw beta versions we did a couple of those for all of our different um, higher ed institutions and then we actually brought some of them on as well we invited them to participate in our final third round of beta testing so various IHEs got got involved in that. Um, and since then, you know, we're, from a marketing standpoint, we're sending lots of things their way. Uh, we have different um, higher ed departments that have joined us as supporters. If you went to our landing page, you'd see, you know, there's, there's logos from different schools that are helping out. Uh, they've incorporated, some of them have incorporated this into their uh, return to school plans. Uh, and uh, one of them in particular, University of Virginia, uh, you know, some, some, well, pretty much every college has some kind of symptom tracking app that they're employing, right? Um, so University of Virginia built their own and they've incorporated the uh, link to COVIDWISE, which is our exposure notification app, right into their symptom tracker so that all of their students who are required to have it, you know, can, can easily get to the app and, and we're encouraging other universities to do the same. Fantastic. Uh, Alabama, of course, you are starting with a university. What's what's uh, what's your thinking there? Yeah. So um, so again, we're pretty much aligned with Jeff and uh, and the state of Virginia. Um, of course, the the development started at the university. The idea started at the university, um, and and development and deployment all at the university level. And so um, so that has been our primary focus, but not our entire focus. Uh, we're getting ready to launch a statewide campaign, uh, communication campaign around this, um, and that will launch next week uh, around getting people to download it and having them understand the, the value of using it. Um, and, uh, and in Alabama, one of the things that is of primary concern to the citizens is uh, the privacy uh, concerns. Um, they the, the the perception is is that their phone is tracking them, and uh, and what they fail to remember is that their phone is already tracking them. It's not this app that's doing it, but their phone is already tracking them. They've got they're using maps and um, all kinds of things on their phone. 
And so we've had to do a lot of education uh, around that because people just don't understand the nuances. And, um, and so, uh, so we feel like that has been pretty successful so far. I mean, we'll see what, what broad adoption is like uh, going forward. But so far, uh, there's been a lot of excitement around it. Uh, we also, like Jeff mentioned with the University of Virginia, we also have built our own um, uh, ongoing symptom and exposure monitoring application that has been out since uh, mid-March. And, um, and we have a kind of a circular link uh, so that you can get from uh, the exposure notification app into Health Check, ours is called Health Check. And, uh, and so there's, there's definitely a way to communicate for the user between the two applications. Excellent. Um, so I believe this is the first time uh, that the US teams have come on a common platform in, in a public way. So I really want to thank everybody for uh, you know, sharing your you know, very important learnings. And I think the most important lesson here is that all of us are here for a very important public cause, uh, and it's just the beginning. It's very exciting to see Virginia and I guess North Dakota and Alabama kind of, you know, taking the kind of, you know, being innovative, being out there and sharing the learnings with everyone and others uh, hopefully will be out very soon. Sam, I know you have many of them coming out in the next couple of weeks as well. Uh, so thank you for sharing, uh, you and Lena, thank you for sharing the tutorial uh, on the app uh, and the server as well. So our, um, our series will continue next Thursday uh, for the Trusted Pandemic Tech at uh, MIT and Berkeley in partnership with many other organizations. And we are here to help states and, and nations uh, in stage one uh, launch their gain and uh, case management apps. So thank you everyone and see you next Thursday.